Thanks, Sharon. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming to our uh, and joining our webinar uh, for January. Um, today, I'm going to be discussing uh, improving prep HPLC, so choices and techniques to improve your prep HPLC separations. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. And so the focus product uh, of our webinar today is going to be the AccuPrep HP150, our uh, prep HPLC instrument. So just to kind of give you an idea on what that instrument looks like that is pictured there. Uh, so as I discuss some of the features, you guys can kind of envision um, the instrument and how, how that's being used. So. Uh, so the outline for today, uh, we're going to be discussing chromatography separation principles first. Uh, then uh, we're going to be discussing sample loading and its impact on chromatography, uh, prep HPLC method optimization, and then finally we're going to showcase how we can make method development faster by using AccuPrep, the AccuPrep's focus gradient generator. So first to help understand some of the uh, principles affecting uh, chromatography performance, we're going to go into some basic uh, background on chroma, chromatographic separation. So uh, basically you begin with two phases, your mobile phase, which is a liquid, and then our stationary phase, which is our column packing. So that could be silica, C18, uh, you know, C18AQ, C8, other medias, um, but that's our stationary phase in our column. The other factor is uh, sample solubility. So ultimately we're kind of um, limited by how much sample we can get dissolved into solution and then how much we can apply onto the column. And so there's several different phenomena uh, driving the interaction uh, that affects the chromatographic process. So one of those uh, is the interaction between the solvent and the, and your compounds uh, of interest, uh, impurities and starting or target materials and things like that. And then also the interaction between the stationary phase uh, with the mobile phase and your uh, compound of interest eluding down the column. So when our compound is you know, interacting strongly with our stationary phase and it's not moving down the column, uh, it kind of stays in, in one place. And then as we increase the polarity of our mobile phase, now that interaction with the uh, compound becomes um, stronger and it wants to elute, begin to elute down the column. Uh, and so that is a changing retention which drives the, the separation, which we'll discuss in more detail. But this is a really good uh, visual example of how the compounds interact with the different molecules in the um, stationary phase and the liquid phase. And the other thing to keep in mind is that these principles apply whether we're doing normal phase or reverse phase. Uh, in normal phase, we have our bare silica it's not functionalized, so it's a lot more uh, polar surface. And we're using a non-polar solvent to start with increasing polarity to dr drive it off the column. Uh, when we're doing reverse phase, phase separation, the silica surface is functionalized with uh, long chains, typically long chain C18, uh, which makes the surface more uh, non-polar. And so now we have a uh, starting uh, mobile phase condition that's high aqueous content water and then we introduce an organic uh, modifier such as acetonitrile or methanol to go ahead and drive the compound down the column uh, with increasing strength. So with this chromatographic process, all, why, you know, what's the, why do we choose to use PrEP HPLC or chromatography? And ultimately our goal is to purify a mixture of compounds. Uh, so we want to isolate our compound of interest and, and get rid of our impurities either retained on the column or uh, coming out at different points in the mobile phase um, percent composition. The best way to quantify the separation of different compounds is using the resolution equation, um, which we describe as this RS. So there's really three components of the resolution equation and understanding these different components um, of the equation helps us to understand what kind of experimental changes we can we can make and then uh, affect the uh, separation so or increase by to increase the resolution or minimize the resolution. So the first 
uh, factor to understand is, is the retention factor. And so we refer to this uh, as a capacity factor, uh, is, is something that is also called, uh, it's noted as a, as a K in the equation here. And basically that's the retention time of the compound on the column uh, based upon the dead time. So if we were to inject a sample, uh, it basically is the, the amount of time it takes for that compound to come out in relation to the um, time of the solvent to a loop. So uh, you'll notice the TR there uh, is a retention time based upon injection. The T0 factors in the dead volume. And then that over the T0 gives us our K value. So if something is <clears throat> comes out elutes earlier, uh, that would be a compound that has a lower K value. While a compound that elutes later has a higher K value and has a stronger retention. And so one of the, the neat things about K and, and, and the, the effect of the mobile phase is that retention is going to be greatly affected by changing the strength of the solvent system. So when we do a gradient elution, uh, this inherently uh, takes advantage of this, this factor. So as we increase the percent B, we're going to be uh, changing the retention factor of the compound. It's going to become a, have a lower K as we increase the percent B. And so it's going to begin to elute down the column. Um, and so this allows us to elute compounds more efficiently down the column uh, as we increase the percent B. The next factor is selectivity. And so this is represented by alpha. And this describes the separating power of the system. So how well can I separate this from other compounds? And so the impact of selectivity on resolution is probably the greatest um, factor. So the idea is that essentially you could have a compound that's traveling down the column while you have a co another compound that is uh, sitting at the head of the column. And that would be, you know, give you a drastic impact on selectivity. When compared to efficiency and retention, uh, you don't really have a diminishing return on results as you increase the selectivity value. Um, if you increase the number of plates of a column, you start to plateau um, on, in regards to its effect on resolution. And the same thing goes along with uh, uh, in regards to retention. So uh, selectivity is a really big uh, factor in improving uh, our methods for our PrEP HPLC separations. And since this is such a big value, what are the things that affect selectivity? So what kind of experimental changes can we make to the system to uh, affect the selectivity and then take advantage of it? Um, you know, load more compound, shorten a method, uh, different kinds of things that we can do to increase throughput. So like I said, selectivity is driven by how well we can separate different compounds out. So if we look at two different compounds, they're going to interact differently with the mobile phase and the stationary phase of your system. And so one of the obvious changes is to, to change your solvent system um, by changing either um, the percent B strength, so doing a gradient elution, or even changing the type of solvent, maybe going from acetonitrile to methanol. And so this HPLC here uh, shows an example of, this, uh, of the same five compound mixture in 40% acetonitrile versus 50% methanol. And we can see that we get different um, res resolution about, uh, around different compounds depending on the conditions. So in the top example with acetonitrile, we're able to uh, get resolution between compounds one, two, and three, but four and five co-elute. Uh, while in the second example, using methanol, compounds two and three begin to co-elute, but we can isolate four and five. There's resolution there. And so those compounds um, are interacting differently with that mobile phase stationary phase com um, combination. And we're seeing a difference in selectivity uh, for the different, different compounds. Another thing that can drastically impact um, your selectivity is the pH of your uh, solution. So acidic and basic modifiers can have um, a strong influence on the uh, ionization of your compound and in what form it's predominant in. And so if you have a, a, an acid modifier and your compound is now uh, protonated, um, 
you know, it's going to be behaving differently, interacting with the solvent phase, the solvent in the stationary phase than if it was unprotonated or an equal equilibration where you have an unprotonated form and a protonated form both interacting with the, the, the column and mole phase. So you can drive uh, the equilibration towards one compound or the other, one form or the other, and then be able to obtain uh, better results that way. And the same thing applies if you were to have a basic modifier. And then finally, the other thing you can do, and, and this is a little bit less common because most of our separations happen on C18, but uh, depending on your needs and how often you're performing purifications of some of these columns, just making a change in your stationary phase in your column could have a drastic impact on the elution of compounds. Um, you look here, we see a difference between a cyano column versus a phenyl functionalized column. And we can see that we can get better resolution with that cyano column and separation um, than using just the phenyl column where we have collusion between peaks four and five. So sometimes just making a stationary phase change can, can be a drastic effect. And finally, the last component is the efficiency of the separation. And so this is driven by the plate count or uh, N of your column. And what it does, is it describes the broadening of the band as it elutes down the column. And this relates to your column performance. It's a really good indicator of column integrity. Um, you know, if you're, so if your column is robust and performing well run after run and has the same uh, column efficiency or plate number, it's usually indicative that your chromatography's, uh, the, the, the performance of your column in, in regards to chromatography is not gonna be changing. If that starts to degrade where your plate count starts to decrease, it's usually indicative of some type of damage to your column potentially, um, or degrading chromatograph performance. Uh, and sometimes we can, we can deal with that you know, decrease in performance because we still maintain resolution, but it's something you want to be aware of uh, as you uh, continue to use that column. The other thing is, uh, you know, we can increase the efficiency of the column by using a longer column. So a 250 millimeter long column versus 150 millimeter long. Uh, this, could, this increases the separation power. Uh, it does take longer to run that way. The, the thing is, is, um, Increasing the length by an order of magnitude increases the efficiency by an order of magnitude. But as we sh showed before on the uh, equation on increasing the efficiency, the effect on the resolution doesn't tend to um, be as significant. So we, it's, it's kind of a diminishing returns um, at some point. So. The other thing is if you are working with larger molecules like peptides, longer columns uh, aren't necessarily better uh, because the um, mechanism of elution down the column is going to be different. So the other thing that affects efficiency, and, and so these are important because these are these are things we can control uh, by having a well-maintained system um, or our injection parameters and that we'll discuss later, but extra column effects like, uh, you know, the size of your injection volume, uh, the dead volume in your system, and then uh, the flow rate that you're choosing can also affect that. Uh, so if you're working at a flow rate that's outside the optimal linear velocity for your um, column and stationary and particle size, then you're going to start to see some diminishing efficiency uh, because of that. So. So the next part here is I want to discuss just the HPLC system path so we kind of understand um, how the system works so we can understand, you know, where we can make uh, improvements um, and how it affects our chromatography. So uh, ultimately your system has a solvent reservoir and your pumps are going to form a gradient um, uh, based upon this. And this gives us our, our mobile phase percent composition and allows us to run uh, isocratic gradient, which would be a set percent B, a step gradient where uh, we have different uh, isocratic uh, holds essentially in the gradient or a linear gradient going from like zero to hundred percent for normal phase or 10 to hundred uh, percent for reverse phase. Um, and so that would give you, allow you to do a, a, a um, linear gradient illusion. And then we have our sample introdu introduction valve. And this is how we get our sample into the, into the uh, stream of the um, eluent. 
our compound is then going to interact with our separation column, and that's where we're going to try and um, take advantage of the selectivity and separate out our compounds. And then it's going to go to the detector. And then if we're using a flash or prep HPLC, it's going to go to the fraction collector. Um, and if we're just doing an analytical run, then it would just go to uh, maybe another detector or um, give us results for integration, integration and quantitation. So we're not going to collect our sample after that. And so just to summarize what I discussed before, just or different isocratic versus gradient methods. Um, an isocratic is a, is a constant uh, solvent composition for the entire run. Um, this can be advantageous for some um, increases in throughput if you're processing a, the same sample over and over again, and you're only interested in one compound because uh, you could isolate, um, isolate around that single compound. It's gonna give you the best separation. Um, but if you're looking at multiple compounds that come out at different percent Bs, then it's a little bit more difficult. And this is going to, um, like I said, it could permit, per, permit you to, to stacked injections that increase throughput um, and some so different advanced separation techniques uh, that the people use in process chemistry. Uh, the, other, um, the other type of, of method would be like a gradient method with step gradients. Um, this is something people also use in production where they'll, they'll do, um, you know, multiple uh, steps, 50%, 70%, 90%, um, or, or any number of steps and, and changes. And it's just a series of isocratic steps. So basically you're getting one compound off with one step, the next compound off with another. And so this is useful if you have multiple compounds you're trying to elute and collect. Uh, on and then the other is a, a linear gradient and so this would be like I said 10 to 100 percent this is great for method development because it lets us because uh, we can determine where our compound is coming out um, the kind of important thing to realize is that you know like we discussed before our compounds either traveling down the column or it's sitting at the head of the column um, not moving at all. Once it starts to move down the column, it's going to ex accelerate if we're increasing the gradient strength behind it. And so when we do a linear gradient from, you know, 10 to 100%, if a compound comes off at 20% B, and it's already off the column at that point, uh, then the rest of the gradient after that's not really worth any value to us, and it's a waste of time. Um, the other thing, you know, if a compound comes off late at 80%, it's not moving down the column at a um, noticeable uh, pace or, or length, I should say, uh, until probably about 70% where it starts to get a K value that's within one to, one to 20. Um, it's just sitting at the head of the column. So finding the uh, kind of isocratic elution point from some of these uh, linear gradients can help us uh, help in our method development for our prep prep method. So ultimately what we like to do is develop a focus gradient um, around that isocratic number. And so this limits the solvent composition range to where it's actually traveling down the column. It kind of gives us, it gives a similar resolution as an isocratic method, but it allows some error in setting the optimal sol solvent composition. So if the isocratic, um, percent B that it comes off at is, you know, say 70% and uh, we have it set at 68, there's going to be some kind of some deviation. But if we set it up over a range from 65 to 75, uh, it, you're not going to see that peak really move too much um, from run to run. So the next uh, part of the talk is going to be discussing sample loading and its impact on chromatography. And so just basic sample introduction and prep HPLC uh, unlike flash, all prep is going to be uh, liquid loading. Um, and so we can do this a, a few different ways, depending on how your system's configured. And, and so on the AccuPrep, you could do a manual injection. Uh, you could do uh, use an auto injector to uh, the auto injector module to pull from a single sample. And you could also take advantage of the auto sampler, which would allow you to do multiple samples and, and then uh, uh, without any user interaction, you can set it up and go and set and run 10 samples in a row without any input. And then finally, if you're doing large uh, volume loading, which which some customers use, particularly in the peptide market, 
um, a sample load pump could be an, uh, an option because you're not limited by what the size of the sample loop is for, for injection volume. Um, and you can in inject very large amounts of sample, dilute sample onto the column before you begin your run. And so because we're doing liquid load, the dissolution solvent is gonna be very important to uh, the performance of the uh, chromatography. The other thing is that your loading tech te technique could also affect your loading amount if you're doing manual injection, then uh, you know there's a potential for um, injecting too much sample and pushing through some, some throughout the back of the loop, uh, just based on the dynamics inside the loop of the fluid. Uh, with an auto sampler, that's not necessarily as, as big of a problem because it's more consistent and there's processes built into the auto sampler to prevent that from happening. Uh, one of the other things that's really important, uh, just in regards to sample introduction is the, the uh, sample quality. Uh, so if your sample has particulates in it or uh, any kind, kind of solids, um, it's really important you filter or centrifuge your sample so that you don't inject those on to your uh, system. Uh, and there's several reasons for that. One, it protects your injection valve rotor seal. And then two, it protects your column investment. So those prep columns are pretty expensive, um, you know, and, and they're meant to, be ran multiple times, um, but if you're injecting, you know, particulates onto there, those are eventually are going to catch on your frit and then decrease your column performance because there's going to be pressure spikes uh, as that frit gets blocked up. So, you know, good sample preparation is important. And another thing you might want to consider using are guard, guard columns uh, on your prep columns to help, uh, you know, be sacrificial to your uh, major investment in the prep column. The other thing, other thing, people a lot of people like to use are the inline filters and those are also helpful. And so the next kind of question and, and, you know, so we've talked about how we can introduce sample on there and, you know, the next question would be how much sample can we load? And so this is just kind of a nice handy guide of some different column sizes and the amount of media that you find inside these reverse phase columns. Um, or normal phase columns too, uh, as they do come that way. But traditionally we're working in reverse phase. And kind of the big difference between reverse phase and normal phase is that functionalized silica isn't able to absorb um, and, and you're not able to load as much compound on the column with reverse phase. So you're looking at kind of a, a, a 0.1 to 1% loading uh, onto a reverse phase column uh, while you can have a tenfold increase for your normal phase column. And so it's key to kind of have an idea on how many grams of meteor in your column. Traditionally, we look at the size of these columns and we'll say, oh yeah, we're running a 10 by 150, but how many grams of media are in there? And for our columns, it's about 28 grams. And that kind of gives you an idea on how much you can load onto there. And the other key thing is the optimum flow rate for these columns, uh, you know, to give you a linear velocity that gives you good efficiency. and you know, we can deviate from these to uh, increase our flow if we have good resolution. Uh, you just need to be aware that as you increase that back pressure on the column, there is a risk of damaging that if you reach a certain point too high of a back pressure. So, so just a detail of the different manual injection options. So on the AccuPrep, you have a lure adapter port we can use. Uh, there's definitely a potential loss of sample because you need to back flush the injection afterwards uh, to make sure it gets into the loop completely. Um, so that's something that you need to do manually and be aware of. The other thing is you can't inject more than 50% of your loop size. So a five milliliter loop standard on the AccuPrep, you wouldn't want to inject more than 2.5 milliliters manually on there. Uh, otherwise you're going to start to lose sample out the, the back end of the loop to waste. And that's, not something that we want for these methods. Um, it's also difficult to reproduce. Um, and you'll notice when you do manual injections, sometimes you'll see some more peak shape anom anomalies because the injection isn't as, as good. You get kind of a um, band broadening within the sample loop because of it. So the other thing, uh, option that some users do, and, and this doesn't really work so well on, on um, the prep scale, but if you're doing smaller semi-prep analytical, uh, you could use a blunt tip needle syringe port. 
This is nice for analytical scale method development because there's no sample loss in the injection port because it injects directly at the at the rotor essentially. And so you don't have to flush it afterwards, but the needle size you need for a prep um, leads to a longer injection time. So it limits the injection speed and it takes longer for larger samples. So the other features of the uh, AccuPrep, some of the modules available are the auto injector. And so that adds a function of automation to the injection process for you. And you can run multiple injections of the same sample um, and you're gonna observe improved peak shape and separation uh, and reproducibility. And you can do injection volumes down to 10 microliters doing that uh, with good reproducibility. The limitation is that you can only do one sample at a time because you have to wash the sample line afterwards. And then there's only one injection volume per series of runs. So uh, once you set it up to go, it's injecting the same volume no matter what. Um, the other thing is that there is a uh, an automated wash sequence that uh, tells the user what they need to do to switch containers to wash that out. So it's a guided process. The other option there, and this is pictured below, is the auto inject or auto sampler. Um, and so the auto sampler has some uh, additional advantages. So we can do multiple different samples. Uh, as you can see there on that right rack, that metal rack there has um, uh, 12 different uh, 33 millimeter uh, high recovery vials in that rack. So we could do up to 12 different samples on that rack, uh, or we could use a test tube rack and have even more samples uh, of lesser volume. This allows you to change uh, uh, you could change your method. So you could do run one run on one column and then another run on another to maybe figure out which column you want to do the purification on when you're doing your method development. Uh, you could also maybe do different solvent systems um, easily and it'll automate it and run them back to back and you'll be ready to go. The other thing is that you can uh, introduce a scouting pause after a run. So say you've got you know five mils of sample you want to purify. You could do your scouting run and put the pause on there and inject maybe you know 200 microliters, see how kind of separation you get. And then you can make sure that it separates your sample and then you can maybe load more or less as needed and then continue through with the rest of the sample. The uh, other advantage of the auto sampler is it's a completely automated wash process. And you also are gaining additional fraction collection capacity um, as you get the external fraction collector in addition to the internal one that's built into the AccuPrep. And the last uh, sample um, introduction module we're going to talk about was a sample load pump. So this is an optional uh, external third pump uh, mod module dedicated to sample loading. And so this is for large volumes of sample uh, to load onto the column. You're not going to be limited by your loop volume at all as it, it, it's directly going through the loop through the to the column during injection during the loading process. And, you know, this is uh, great for loading uh, of dilute samples, uh, particularly in a weak solvent. So that's kind of the, the key thing here is that when you are loading this amount of sample onto the column, it needs to be a compound that is in a solvent system, your, your solvent system that you dissolved it in, where it's not going to elute down the column at all. So, you know, so say I had a compound that only dissolved in methanol. If I load a hundred milliliters of methanol in there on, onto that column, um, that compound's probably traveling down uh, pretty significantly. You're gonna see some band broadening and column breakthrough maybe before the method begins. Um, but if I did that same injection in 100% water, uh, you know, as long as my sample's uh, soluble in it um, and dilute enough, then I could go ahead and load that. And it's just gonna sit at the head of the column as it loads. It's not it's going to be strongly interacting with the stationary phase and it's not going to begin to elute down the column till my method begins. So that's kind of the key um, characteristic of that kind of separation and loading uh, and to take advantage of it. It essentially focuses the sample on the head of the column. This is really useful in peptide purification. Uh, there's some value in it in natural product isolation and any application where you can use the weak solvent for loading and your compound isn't traveling um, under those conditions. The other nice thing about this is it allows an adjustable flow rate during the loading process. And you could also configure the pump, uh, configure the system to load while the main pumps are running, which offers an additional 
uh, kind of dilution factor and preventing of uh, the compound traveling down the column. Uh, to visualize this, we kind of have to go back to flash. And uh, because of the, the, the stainless steel columns, we can't see what's going on in there. But with the flash columns, we can see through and we can load a colored compound. And on the left there is a, is a compound that is in a strong um, solvent. It's injected with a strong solvent, it's dissolved in a strong solvent and injected on there. And you can see just after injection of loading the compound, the color has already, you know, traveled down to the bottom of the column. So you've got band broadening, it's already traveling, you're not getting good retention and, uh, and not getting a good band. And the right is a sample dissolved in a weak solvent. And you can see after loading, we don't see any of the color, uh, you know, down the column there until it starts to uh, reach a percent B where it, it begins to travel. So this is a really good visual example to visualize how the compounds are behaving on the column when we're loading it in a weak versus a strong solvent. Now that we visualize that on the column itself, we can also now look at chromatograms and compare them um, with different loading solvents and we can kind of understand their effects a little bit better. So, like I said, considerations for your loading solvent, you want to comp it's a compromise between good dissolution while minimizing the effect on the integrity of the chromatographic separation. So, uh, enough solvent to dissolve it um, and a strong enough solvent to dissolve it, but, but no more. Um, if it, you know, polar compounds uh, can be difficult. A lot of times people like to inject samples dissolved in DMSO. Uh, so this is a, an example of a compound that is dissolved in DMSO that's polar. Uh, it, it elutes fairly early in the um, chromatogram. And that's the other thing I'll point out is that early eluting compounds are gonna be a lot more susceptible to uh, problems during loading than late eluting compounds in the gradient. Uh, just because naturally as we increase percent B, uh, we're going to increase the K value um, uh, more quickly. So uh, in, the, in the case of the top injection, this is one milliliter of DMSO. You can see that first peak there is the DMSO peak. And then we get baseline resolution for our compounds. Um, and so it's a satisfactory purification. You know, if we increase that to 2.5 mils of, of injection volume, then we start to see breakthrough with the DMSO peak and we, we lose... Um, resolution between the two peaks there. So that in that case, you know, we, we we're not able to increase the amount of loading. So we're gonna have to do multiple one milliliter injections to purify this compound because we can't we can't increase the loading amount anymore. In this case, um, this is the same sample. The concentration of the sample is the same as DMSO water, but we've increased the loading capacity. So. In this case, you don't see the DMSO peak because uh, there's no DMSO in the sample. So that peak is gone. But we get baseline resolution in 2.5 mils of water, uh, which we didn't do before with uh, DMSO. We are, all, we are also able to increase the volume, injection volume even more, uh, up to four milliliters uh, of sample, uh, or four milliliters of, uh, of the water. Um, with sample in it. So we were actually able to load more compound in that four mils of water and still achieve baseline separation. So you can see how the injection process with DMSO greatly disturbed the, the chromatography there. Uh, the next thing is, um, is, is loading different volumes of sample. So on the AccuPrep, we have different loop sizes available. Uh, we have a hundred microliter loop and a one milliliter loop. Uh, that you can put on there. You can. You need to buy them um, um, from Riodine or uh, another uh, uh, Valco. Um, but you can put those those um, lo loading loops on there. And so, if you're doing work on a 4.6 millimeter column, this is important um, to give you uh, good results uh, because with a larger sample loop, you have a larger longer path and that's gonna result in more dwell volume. Um, the other thing is you can't load more than 50% of the loop size with these size loops. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, but you're able to run uh, those small injections on there. Now for prep scale uh, sample loop loading, this is a little bit more uh, forgiving. So with loops that are um, 
the, you know, the loop that's standard on the AccuPrep and larger, uh, there's a laminar flow profile as the tubing transitions from 1 16th tubing to 1 8th OD uh, for the, you know, the wider diameter volume uh, loop for the volume increase. And so this gives you increased loading capacity. So uh, this will allow you to dissolve in an increased volume of weaker solvent. And it will also have less sample loss out the back end. So when you're using an auto sampler where we have reproducible technique in our uh, injection, uh, we're able to inject up to, to four mils uh, uh, without any loss um, in the sample loop. And the reason for this is we cushion that injection with air uh, as part of the injection process to prevent mixing in that laminar flow profile from um, presenting itself. If you're doing manual injection though, you're still limited to 50% of the loop size because of that. And so finally, we're gonna get into kind of the, the, the probably the most interesting and important part of the, the talk here is just prep HPLC method development in general. And so ultimately, you know, what are the goals of our method development and how much time do we want to devote to it? So there's a couple questions. And you know, one is how many, how much sample do I need to purify, right? If I'm only going to be doing one run, then you know, as long as I get my compound clean, that's that's really what matters. So I can, um, you know, be a little bit more, um, you know, forgiving maybe with a longer default method run, just because I'm going to be running it once. But if you've got a lot of sample you're purifying and you're going to have to do multiple injections, then we want to be able to optimize that run so that we can do. Um, as many runs as possible in, in a lower amount of time. And so we want fast runs. We want to be able to load as much compound as possible. So minimize the number of runs and then also <clears throat> minimize uh, our solvent usage in any workup. So uh, if we're using any modifiers, then we want to uh, use volatile modifiers. And so traditionally, a lot of times you're going to see some variations of this, but ultimately a lot of users have uh, kind of a system that's based upon a zone gradient system. So what they'll do is they'll run a, uh, run a run on their analytical system, a scouting run, and they're gonna divide that analytical <coughs> scouting gradient into five to 10 different zones, depending on the complexity of their system. And where the compound elutes at, uh, you know, zone one, zone two, zone three, these different retention times, um, there is a matching prep method that correlates with compounds that elute in that zone. So if it comes out in zone two, then they would be running a uh, gradient from five to 25%. Uh, if it comes out in zone four, then maybe they're running a gradient from 45 to 65% for their prep method. And so a lot of people have set these systems up and, um, you know, it's, it's, it does a you know, fairly good job of giving you a, a pretty quick and dirty uh, optimized gradient to run. So it's a, it's a good technique, um, but it does require to do a run an analytical system. And it also requires you to calibrate that analytical system and have some standards and some development and building um, up that process. The other limitation of that <clears throat> is that when you're near the transition from zone to zone, so if I'm kind of in late zone two or early zone three, I'm getting towards the fringes of that prep gradient. So I'm starting to lose some value on the early end or the late end of the gradient uh, in the prep method. So it is kind of a waste of um, some of the time in the gradient. So you can optimize these things a little bit, uh, a little bit better. Um, you know, so here's an example of of a uh, a run uh, and the default run here. So this is a mixture of uh, four different compounds dissolved in DMSO, and you can see if we run a gradient from uh, 10 to 100 percent over 15 minutes here, we get uh, we barely get resolution between these four peaks. I would say peaks three and four we don't quite get baseline resolution, but um, it's, you know, you can see these four compounds here though, which is, is nice. But if we do the focus gradient and we run this system from 53, or sorry, uh, 58 to 68% over that same amount of time uh, of 12 minutes, then we get 
baseline resolution between the compounds and we get full separation of them. And so this increases, uh, this also allows for increased sample loading and increases your throughput because now you're able to load more sample and doing a, doing potentially in a shorter amount of time. So, so when do we want to spend time, uh, invest time in, in doing method development? Um, it's useful when we do do multiple injections. So the time savings you gain for that optimized run are going to be multiplied by however many runs you have to take. And the uh, AccuPrep software now provides a simple routine that calculates close to optimum conditions for you based upon one scouting run coming from either an analytical system or from uh, you know, a run on that same column on the AccuPrep. And it requires minimal user input, uh, no um, calibration if you're doing it on the AccuPrep itself. And it's going to uh, zone in particularly on your peak of interest. It's not gonna just give you a zone. Um, it's gonna pinpoint on your, your peak of interest. So it eliminates the need to program a series of focus gradients on the, on the system also because the algorithm's taking care of it in the software. Um, so in the case I'm going to show you, uh, this is a utilization of the AccuPrep HP 150's focus gradient generator uh, for both the analytical run and the purification run on our system um, or the scouting run on our system. You can also do the calibrate an analytical system in the lab um, to use the same algorithm and just punch in your retention time onto the AccuPrep and then it'll load a focus gradient for you also. So that's another workflow. Um, the loop bypass feature on the HP 150 is nice. Uh, if you're running 4.6 millimeters on the AccuPrep, um, it allows you to uh, simulate a five milliliter loop uh, as a smaller size loop as it's gonna cut it out of the process before the gradient begins. And the other thing is that you can use any size column to run the scouting gradient. So you could just do a low loading amount on the column that you're actually gonna be doing your prep run on uh, to optimize your, your method to run your scouting gradient. So I'm just gonna walk through the process here. Uh, so the focus gradient generator procedure, um, you need to set up a scouting method for your uh, column. And so we do this in the configuration menu that you can find in the tools menu and then prep HPLC tab. And if you select the column uh, and define methods, uh, you're gonna come up with this menu here and you'll choose new scouting method. And then you're gonna enter some parameters. So you're gonna enter as a starting percent B. And so traditionally with C18, you'd be use, use like a 5% starting or 10% starting percent B. But if you were using C18 AQ or a silica column, or because uh, you can use this on normal phase two, that do, it doesn't matter what the stationary phase, as long as your stationary phases match, um, you can choose different starting percent Bs. The other things you can modify are, are the flow rate, so that affects your algorithm, and then also your focusing range. So we could focus over a range of plus or minus 5% or plus or minus 10%, um, depending if you want a little bit more forgiveness um, in, your, in your procedure. So, but either, either one works really well. So you, once you set up the scouting gradient, when you select a column on, your, on, on the main screen, uh, now the scouting run is gonna show up there on the bottom and you would choose that as your method. And it's gonna generate a method that runs a six minute gradient from uh, whatever your starting percent B is to 100% B. And then it's gonna be followed by a wash period to push everything off through the detector um, and off the column. Um, at the end. So there's no changes that you can make to the gradient at all. It's all fixed. So everything is going to be grayed out as far as making changes to that. You can change, make changes to your detection settings though. So once you've run that run, you're going at the end of the uh, run, you're going to be given the chromatogram and you'll notice that there's going to be a focus button here. Uh, and this is what's going to allow you to choose which peak of interest you want to purify or target for purification. And it's gonna maximize the resolution around that. So let's say we're interested in peak three here and we've got five peaks of interest and we're interested in peak three. So we're going to click on peak uh, three with our finger 
and select that. And you're just selecting a retention time and you can slide that if you need to. And then you're gonna choose what column. Um, you can zoom in here and, and you can pinch zoom to, to get a better look at that and pinpoint where you want that. Move the red line to the desired peak. And then you're going to select the prep column that'll be used to focus the gradient. And so you can scale this up to different size columns as long as the media matches. And then you're gonna hit the focus button. And the key thing, like I said, is the scout and the prep column must be the same media. And so now it's gonna generate a focus media. And so for this method, it generated uh, a gradient beginning at about 42, 43% and running it to 52 to 53%. And the results of that run is you can see significant resolution around peak three there, um, where you have now probably two minutes, two plus minutes on both sides of that peak where you could load more compound now and increase the loading amount for your method. Uh, the other thing is that the peaks outside that focus gradient, so peaks one and two are gonna begin to co-elute. So if we're not interested in those, we don't care about that. And then peaks three and uh, you know four and five, the, they're, they're also coming off, they're essentially coming off in that wash phase. And you'll notice that the target peak should be in the center of the gradient. And like I said, we've gained significant resolution around it. So uh, today we discussed uh, the principles behind PrEP HPLC separations. Uh, we've highlighted different approaches to method development and optimizations for resolution. Uh, we've looked and contrasted the benefits of different loading techniques and the advantage of some of the different modules the AccuPrep HP150 offers uh, to enhance um, some of the loading options that are available to you. And we chose, we showed the importance of choosing the best loading solvent and its effect on loading capacity and the integrity of the chromatogram. And then we also, um, we talked about sample loop loading and, and eliminating sample loss. So um, just, I, I did want to point out here that we uh, have monthly webinars every, every, every month we have a webinar. Uh, our next webinar is February 18th. Uh, and Jack Silver, uh, my colleague, is going to be presenting about flash method development from TLC chromatography plates. And then I'll be presenting again in March, uh, talking about large-scale flash separations on our uh, torrent um, product and discussing sample loading method development and then ultimate scalability. And then in April, Jack's going to be presenting again about easy prep gradients from analytical runs. And so that's going to be a really interesting talk. Um, that kind of goes into more detail about the focus gradient and um, coming from analytical systems into some more in-depth uh, analysis of that. So with that, uh, are there any questions? You guys feel free to post any questions in the Q&A section there. We can answer those. I've got a couple already. Um, so let me start with those. Uh, one of the first ones here is how does injection volume affect the resolution? Um, and so just to kind of repeat, so the injection volume is gonna essentially cause the, that initial band to be larger on the column. Um, and so if we end up using more injection solvent, we get band broadening and you're gonna decrease the amount of resolution between peaks as all your bands are gonna widen. So. Um, that's just something to keep in mind. That's why we want a weak dissolution solvent to minimize that band broadening um, and smaller injection volumes uh, as possible. Um, let's see, next one here is, does methanol or cyanonitrile have better resolution in reverse phase? Uh, so it depends on your compounds and your, your stationary phase, it's it's all going to be unique to individual compounds, whether your method is going to perform better with meth, methanol or uh, acetonitrile. Um, so that's just dependent on each separation. Let's see here. Next question is, do we have any more information about using the system for low volume analytical runs? So the AccuPrep can run down to one mil a minute. Um, one of the unique features on the AccuPrep that uh, was implemented with the HP150 release was uh, a sample loop bypass. So essentially what happens is uh, you could load small injections on the five milliliter loop and it's gonna automatically bypass the sample loop to decrease the system dwell time. 
so that you can run down on a 4.6 millimeter column without having to uh, uh, worry about uh, increased lag time in the system. Because obviously we do have a prep system, there's larger volume compared to a analytical HPLC, but you can run 4.6 millimeter columns on there. Uh, so this is one way to mitigate that dead volume. So that's one of the unique features. Uh, so you can run down at lower flow rates uh, and, you, and use those columns. You can also scale up from your 4.6 millimeter column up to the 20, uh, 30 millimeter and 50 millimeter columns too using the focus gradient generator. So uh, that scale up is automatically built in into the software interface there for you. Um, if you have more specific questions there, feel free to reach out to me and I can help uh, answer those for you. Uh, let's see. So one, another good question is on the focus gradient system, do you need to do a wash run uh, each and every run or you can do it every two to three runs? And this is a good question. Uh, so it really depends on the, the compound and the mixtures that you're putting on there. So uh, if those uh, impurities are occupying kind of space at the top of the column and kind of sitting there, it's going to decrease a little bit of the interaction with the um, compounds you're loading on your next run. So you're gonna to start to maybe notice some uh, um, decreases in chromatography performance over so many runs. That, it depends on your sample, how many runs that takes. Uh, so we we traditionally just build a washout into each run when we do the focus gradient gener generator. But if you're doing processes like this, then uh, this is something that you can take advantage of by you know doing the wash um, you know, after you know, two or three runs. And how I would do that, I would I would set up a, a sample queue uh, with your auto sampler and, you know, would set up the focus gradient uh, that you've determined to be best for your sample uh, for one queue item and do your three injections. And then just follow that with a 100% wash step as a, a second uh, series of injections. And you can take advantage of the, the no inject, no collect feature um, so that it doesn't inject any sample. Um, and then if, you're, if you do want to uh, recover that sample, then you would need to uh, collect from the waste then. But you can automate that process in the queue if you'd like to do that. Okay, let's see, we got some other good questions coming in, so keep them coming. Um, okay, so uh, kind of, someone's got a tough separation on the, uh, um, on their compounds, they have an AccuPrep system. So they only see one peak in the analytical. Uh, and then on the flash system, they see uh, essentially a hump in a main peak. So this is where a focus gradient generator would offer a lot of um, a lot of help for you. So you could do that, that run, uh, the scouting run on it, and then focus on that region uh, so that you're maximizing the resolution where that one peak is, that the one peak you see is coming out. And a lot of times, if you actually see have co-alluding peaks, when you do the focus gradient, it's gonna you're gonna get enough resolution to separate those um, by going to that focus gradient range. So, uh, if you have more questions on how to do that, feel free to reach out, and I'll I'll help you out uh, and guide you through that process a little bit more detail. And the focus gradient on different size columns. Uh, so that's a good question. So the um, what really matters is probably the length of the column more so the diameter. As you scale up, uh, you know, your flow rate, flow rate is going to be proportional. It's going through the same length column. Um, the linear velocity is maintained and all that's factored into the algorithm for the focus gradient generator. Um, we also, uh, if you're using a longer column, then it's a longer scout method. So that's compensated for in the algorithm also. So there's really nothing that you need to, to worry about on your end uh, to correct for that. It's all it's all taken care of in the, the background algorithm for the focus gradient generator, which is why it's so great. Okay, good question here. A concentrated sample becomes viscous. Will it cause band def deformation? And will it be easier, better to use more dilute sample to avoid the viscosity? And so I think over time, you're going to notice uh, deformation of the uh, frit. Um, at the head of the column from that pressure spike from that increased uh, viscosity solvent. So like when you're using DMSO, um, that's why a guard column is a really good idea if you're using DMSO a lot because it basically is uh, diluting it down before it gets to the column a little bit um, with a minimal band broadening. So 
you're right over time that would cause some deformation of the column and then obviously that would affect your column performance and integrity so uh using more dilute sample to avoid the viscosity would be another option but you would be competing with uh uh, but other potential uh, broadening issues, um, depending on the solvent that you're diluting it with. So if you chose a strong solvent, it would potentially cause your compound to begin traveling down the column um, before you really want it to. And that's not a, not a good thing. You're not getting your retention that you need. And then finally, good question. Uh, last, last question, last two questions here. And if uh, I don't answer a question, you just feel free to reach out to me um, and, and I'll, try and get them answered via email, uh, but we are running out of time here. So uh, one is if you inject more volume then the injection loop, hold, loop holds, what happens? And so traditionally, you know, if you're using an analytical system, what we do is we overload the loop so that we can get a fixed volume injection. Um, and that's so that, you know, there's no, um, you know, so if you have a, a, a 10 microliter loop, you're going to inject, you know, 30 microliters so that you know that what you're injecting on the system is 10 microliters. When we're doing prep, that's obviously not something that we want uh, because we don't want to lose our sample. So depending if you're using the auto injector, uh, auto sampler, or uh, doing manual injection with the larger loops, like a five mil loop, if you were to inject five mils on that, you would start in, in doing manual injection. What happens is you create a laminar flow profile in that uh, sample loop. And so once you get to about 2.5 mils and more or more, uh, you're starting to push some sample out the back end of the injection loop to your waste stream. Um, with the auto sampler, this doesn't happen because we bracket it with air that that um, eliminates that laminar flow profile. And so we can inject up to like four, four and a half milliliters on the five mil loop without losing any sample. And then last question here. Um, let's see here. Uh, so we got a customer here who's been experiencing loss of column integrity uh, with their prep HPLC column. Um, they've had loss of resolution and a pulsating appearance um, directly affected by the flow rate. And then you're noticing it, I guess, in the baseline and the peaks, and they're seeing air bubbles post solvent mixer. Um, and they're wondering if the excessive amount of air is damaging the packing of the column. And so depending on how much air is coming through, that could be uh, something that um, affects the column over time. It, it really kind of depends on how much. I, you don't want to dry these columns out. Probably the pulsation is more of a flow rate uh, variation as uh, um, because you have those air bubbles you're not delivering the flow that you suspect. And then you're also getting kind of a um, sorry, flow rate pulsation from that. So that's probably affecting the actual, what you're witnessing on the chromatography there um, more so than the uh, damaging of the column potentially, but I can't rule that out. So if you guys have other questions or I uh, didn't answer a question fully, feel free to reach out to me and uh, we, uh, I'd be glad to help you guys out. Uh, Joshua. Dot level at teledyne.com. Thanks. Hey.